Hello everybody, welcome to your OB course. Right now we're going to be talking about high risk labor and birth as well as caring for families post cesarean section. So the first thing we're going to talk about is dystocia. What is dystocia? So by definition, dystocia is basically abnormally slow progressing labor or abnormally long labor. Okay, this results for the most part from abnormalities of um, either the powers, which is the contractions, the passenger, meaning fetal presentation, or the passageway, which is the pelvis. Okay, so there's multiple things that can cause the dystocia. Okay, sometimes the terms dystocia and failure to progress are um, used interchangeably, um, which they can be. So it's important that we understand that it's basically prolonged or abnormally long labor. So let's talk about uterine dystocia. What is uterine dystocia? It means that the, the culprit or the reason for the prolonged labor is because of a dysfunction of the uterus. And we have two different scenarios that can occur. You have hypertonic uterine dysfunction, which means the contractions are happening frequently. Hypertonic, right? A lot of them. They're frequent, they're painful, which means they are strong. However, they are not effective and they do not cause or they do not result in dilation or effacement. So there is no cervical change. So the patient could be contracting one after the other, one after the other, and the cervix remains closed or unchanged. Um, what happens with patients who experience hypertonic, hyper, remember that word, hypertonic uterine dysfunction, is that because of the prolonged labor and the fact that the uterus is contracting, you know, for, for so frequently and, and um, strongly, the fetus runs the risk of having, um, of developing asphyxia and they become intolerant to the labor process. Okay, placental perfusion is what causes the baby to develop or asphyxia, the cause for developing asphyxia. Um, one of the risk factors for this is being an oliparous woman, meaning women who have never had a baby that are having their first child are at risk for having this type of uterine dystocia. Then the other end of the spectrum is hypo, hypotonic uterine dysfunction. Okay, the pressure of the contractions is insufficient. So they could be occurring, but they're not strong enough. They may or may not be painful, and um, the woman usually does not progress, okay? Um, it usually, you know, they'll start off normal, having contractions, they progress, but when they enter the active phase, the contractions get weaker. It's almost as if the uterine muscle becomes tired, and then they contract, but it's a weak contraction. Think about... If you're doing weights for a long time, after a while, your muscle is so tired that it becomes weak and you can no longer lift that five pound weight that you could so easily lift before. Okay, in this situation, the woman is at risk for exhaustion, infection, of course, related to the prolonged labor. And then the baby is also, again, because they're exhausted, the prolongation of the labor can lead to intolerance to labor and ultimately um, asphyxia in the fetus. <clears throat> We have what we call active phase disorders. So we learned that we have four stages of labor. Within the first stage, we have um, different phases, right? We have the latent phase, the active phase, active phase, the transitioning phase, etc. Well, this these disorders occur during the active phase, which we know historically we've referred to them as you know four centimeters. Now that's no longer the case. According to A1, active phase is considered from six centimeters onward, six to eight centimeters, right? So once the patient is six centimeters, this is when they're in the active phase and all of a sudden they stop progressing, okay? Um, what happens at this moment is a lot of physicians will say, all right, she's already six centimeters, she's contracting away. However, there's no cervical change and many times this causes or results in a cesarean section. Please note, all right, that in order for a physician to say that arrest of labor has occurred or that they're doing a C-section as a result of, you know, an active phase disorder such as arrest of labor, 
the woman has to be at least six centimeters dilated with ruptured membranes so if the if the membranes are intact she doesn't qualify for you know saying oh you know didn't progress um she has to be six centimeters ruptured membranes and one of the following okay so it's three the criteria they have to meet three characteristics six centimeters ruptured membranes and four hours or more of adequate contractions or six hours of or more of inadequate contractions and no cervical change so if your patient is six centimeters dilated ruptured membranes and she has been contracting every two to three minutes contractions lasting 45 to 60 seconds for four hours and nothing there's no cervical change okay you can call it an arrest of labor now if she is not contracting every two to three minutes or doesn't have a labor pattern, let's say she's contracting every five minutes, every two, every eight, like randomly, there's no pattern. So those are, those are what we call inadequate contractions. Then you have to allow for not four, but six hours to go by before the doctor can say, oh, it's an arrest of labor. Okay. In the first stage, nonetheless, still the active phase. So keep that in mind. These are the things that, um, that occur. Um, please make sure that you review all of that. <clears throat> if um, we continue looking at the different disorders, we have um, what we call precipitous labor. Okay, precipitous labor basically is labor that lasts less than three hours from the onset of labor to birth. These are the women. It usually happens to grand multi multiparous women or women who have a history of um, precipitous labor. If you've had six babies and this is your seventh baby, um, guess what? Your body already knows what to do. Okay. It says, oh, it's time to deliver this baby. Boom. And it can go from the onset of labor to the moment you actually are, have already delivered the baby in less than three hours. Okay. So that's what that means by definition, labor to birth less than three hours some of the things that can happen is it can cause the the baby at risk for hypoxia and at risk for central nervous system depression related to the hypoxia from the rapid birth so it's a little traumatic because it doesn't allow the baby to 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 progress slowly and for the woman it can actually lead to lacerations etc because it doesn't allow the tissue to expand as it normally would if you allow it, you know, if, if a woman were to progress like they normally would, which takes a lot longer than three hours, right? Now, the other type of dystocia is fetal dystocia. What does that mean? It just means that the culprit in this case is the fetus, okay? It may be caused because the baby is too big. Maybe you have a baby who is being born to a diabetic mom and they're macrosomic, more than 4,000 grams. If the baby has a malpresentation, they could be OP or occiput posterior, where the back of the head is towards the back of the mom and making the labor difficult. It could also be due to fetal anomalies, okay? Some of the complications related to fetal dystocia are asphyxia, also related to the prolonged labor injuries um, of the baby. For example, if you have a baby that's really large and they're being you know, delivered vaginally, we know that during the birth trauma if they're using forceps we can have nerve damage sometimes the physicians you know accidentally or even intentionally sometimes have to fracture the clavicle of the baby to be able to get the baby out particularly when we have um, cephalopelvic disproportion where either the head is too big or the pelvis is too small and it is causing this dystocia it also increases the chances for maternal laceration for obvious reasons okay so we need to take into consideration the size of the baby, the presentation of the baby, the position, and um, also the maternal, the size and the shape of the maternal pelvis, as well as the quality of the contractions. Please note that there are multiple, there's a, an array of malpresentations. You have occiput posterior, which is the example that I gave, face presentation. When you have a baby that has, that the face is what's presenting, you know, that that is, quite a challenge when you have brow presentation when you have breach frank breach complete breach foot length 
single or double. You know, some of these babies cannot be delivered vaginally. When you have a complete, a frank breach, we usually do a C-section, a face presentation. Those babies cannot be delivered vaginally and require um, surgical intervention. Um, I already alluded to a to it a little bit. The pelvic dystocia, which is the size of the pelvis and the shape of the pelvis, does not lend itself for proper vaginal delivery. Okay. So these are the things we need to take into consideration. Um, some of the things that we will find in pelvic dystocia is that the baby will not descend. Maybe she can progress. She can start dilating and the baby will not go into the birth canal and it can't enter the birth canal because the pelvis is maybe too narrow. So those are the things that we would know. An experienced nurse knows that if her patient is contracting properly and she is dilating and the baby is really high, meaning it's still very up there, not engaged in the birth canal, we suspect that the pelvis may be too narrow and it doesn't allow for the fetus to come down. Okay. Um, I had already talked about precipitous labor. I just have things out of order. So let's talk about induction of labor. What is an induction of labor? An induction of labor is the deliberate or intentional stimulation of contractions before it happens naturally, before it happens, you know, um, spontaneously. And many times this is done at maternal request. She's 39 weeks, you know, they allow it at 39 weeks and the mom can say, you know, I'm going on a trip, I'm going on a vacation, or my husband's going on a business trip, whatever the case may be, and I want to have this baby already. They can request it. It is not recommended, all right? We do not want to induce labor unless it is medically necessary, okay? What are some of the medical indications? If you have a patient who's 37 weeks, but she's a gestational diabetic, and the baby's already weighing 4,500 grams at 37 weeks, you don't want, not 4,500, but 4,000 grams, let's say, at 37 weeks, you don't want to continue waiting because the mom, you know, the, the placenta probably cannot sustain a baby that's, that's going to continue getting larger. So you want to make sure sometimes doctors will induce that. Um, if mom is hypertensive, okay, if they develop preeclampsia and the baby's already 37 weeks, 36 weeks, they're like, you know what, this baby at this point they can start developing an intrauterine growth restriction because of the hypertension. And so it just gets to a point where they are better outside of the uterus than they are in utero. So for cases like those, they can induce labor. Okay. There is, like I said, elective induction. Labor induction should be performed only for medical indications, but if it's done for non-medical indications, the mom must be a minimum of 39 weeks gestation and the cervix should be favorable. What is favorable? According to your textbook, they should have a Bishop score of eight or higher. All right. And I think we reviewed Bishop score before where we talked about, um, the Bishop score basically tells you how prepared or how ready the cervix is for birth. Is it soft? Is it dilated? Is it effaced? Where is it? Is it posterior, anterior? You know, the location of the cervix itself. For elective inductions, it, this actually accounts for um, um, 25 of 50 percent of the inductions tend to be elective and not medically necessary. If they're going to do that, they need to definitely be sure that the patient is at least 39 weeks gestation. How are they going to know that? They need to have a record of an ultrasound that was done prior to 20 weeks gestation that's confirming the gestational age of 39 weeks or later. They have to have fetal heart tones that were documented um, by Doppler for 30 weeks. Okay, remember we can hear with a Doppler, um, we can hear the fetal heart rate at usually 12 weeks. So they're saying you need to have heard it for 30 weeks before you can do this. It's either or. You don't have to require all of three. You require either having an ultrasound 20 weeks before, having heard heart, fetal heart tone via Doppler for you know at least 30 weeks, or that it has been 36 weeks since the, um, a positive serum or urine pregnancy test was confirmed. So they must meet one of those. I can tell you from experience that most physicians will provide a report of an ultrasound that was done um, prior to 20 weeks gestation, showing the gestational age. 
Contraindications for an induction. Very simple. If your patient for any reason cannot deliver vaginally, do they have active herpes? Do they have um, placenta previa or avasa previa? Is the baby breached or transfer a lot? Anybody who cannot deliver vaginally, why are you going to induce them if they cannot be successful, right? So you don't do that. Um, if they also have a prior myomectomy, meaning the removal of uh, uterine fibroids, we cannot, you know, that's no longer an intact uterus. You cannot induce it. They can have a VBAC. They can have a, not a VBAC, I'm sorry. They can have a vaginal delivery. However, you can't use anything to induce or augment them because it's not an intact uterus, okay? They have a previous C-section. We're not doing this. And of course, if you are finding yourself with a, an, an emergency such as a cord prolapse, it is not the time for an induction because an induction can be lengthy, okay? How do we induce? There's multiple methods. We can use oxytocin. Oxytocin causes contractions, all right? Um, if the cervical conditions are, you know, acceptable, they have a good Bishop score, Bishop score of eight or so, um, you can induce with oxytocin. Um, the half-life of oxytocin is about 10 minutes, which means you need to know um, that you have to connect your oxytocin to the closest port to the axis. All right, what does that mean? That if you have to stop the oxytocin because it is resulting in tachycystole, you're not going to run everything that's on that IV line into your patient, making matters worse, okay? Um, with oxytocin, please note it's a high alert medication. Okay, so it has to be ran through a pump. I um, will tell you a story. I had a coworker, and she wasn't a coworker of mine. She happened to have worked at the place I worked at before. She was gone before I got there. She went to um, administer a bolus of lactated ringers on a patient, and she accidentally picked up a bag of oxytocin, and she was bolusing her with oxytocin. Of course, within minutes, the baby was in distress and they were rushing her back to an emergency cesarean section when the anesthesiologist realized that what was being bolused, bolus means infused quickly, was not lactated ringers, but oxytocin. Okay. She's lucky she got to keep her license, but nonetheless, she lost her job. Um, that is why before you hang or give any medication, it needs to be scanned and it needs to be verified. Oxytocin in particular, it is, again, a high alert medication. Contraindications for this, again, that's a previa, abnormal fetal presentation. Anything that will prevent a woman from delivering vaginally is contraindicated. You can't use oxytocin for that, okay? The side effects of oxytocin are primarily related to tachycystole, okay, meaning a lot of contractions because oxytocin is a uterotonic. It causes contractions. So if you have a patient who becomes tachycystolic, meaning she's contracting more than five contractions in 10 minutes, you want to stop it. And remember that the half-life is 10 minutes. Um, there are different concentrations. You have 10 units of oxytocin in 1,000. You have 20 in 1,000. You can have 30 in 500, et cetera. Um, if you develop, when you are administering oxytocin, please note the goal is to develop a labor pattern. Okay. If your baby becomes compromised, if they go into, you know, a bad category two or category three, you want to discontinue the use of oxytocin. Okay. Um, mm -mm -mm -mm. So again, tachycystole means you have more than five contractions in a 10-minute period, averaged over 30 minutes. This also includes excessive uterine activity with contractions that last two minutes or longer. So can you imagine, you hold your breath for two minutes. When we have a contraction for two minutes, in essence, that's the best way I can you know, describe it, is the baby's having to hold his breath for two minutes, okay? Because remember, the uterus is contracted, so the uterine perfusion decreases. Your baby's becoming compromised. These are what we call tetanic contractions. So we have to be very careful when we're administering oxytocin because again, it can lead to tachycystole. The other way we can induce is through cervical ripening, okay? 
if the bishop score of your patient okay is um greater than eight you can induce with oxytocin if it's less than eight then um then you can do cervical ripening what does it mean it means that i'm sorry less than six if you have a bishop score less than six you are going to do cervical ripening cervical ripening we administer medication it could be cervidil it could be um which is dinoprostol we can also use uh, misoprostol or cytotec we can also have mechanical methods which means sometimes we put in a little foley inside the cervix we fill it up with fluid and we put a weight on it sometimes we tie you know i know this is crazy but a bag of lr and it pulls on it and when that inflated balloon comes out through the cervix it means they're about three centimeters dilated so that would be a mechanical method um we also use hygroscopic dilators um laminaria is one of them lamisal is another one there's a whole bunch of different products there and it's basically dried it's made from dried seaweed and it's placed in there like a tampon in the cervix and as it absorbs moisture it dilates the cervix those are mechanical methods um we use we also do sweeping of, or stripping of the membranes this is done by the physician they put in the digits inside and they separate um the chorionic membrane from the wall of the cervix and the lower uterine segment okay so the primary care provider will stimulate labor in this manner many times they do it in the office and then they send them to the hospital because it puts them into labor that is what we would call cervical ripening okay so um remember this if you have a bishop score of six or more ideally an eight you are a good candidate for an induction if it's less than a six you cannot use oxytocin you have to do cervical ripening first cervical ripening what it does is it makes the cervix really soft sometimes they dilate sometimes they don't some people contract others don't but the purpose of it is to prepare the cervix so that when you start administering oxytocin that causes contractions, um, it'll dilate, you know, with ease. So just so you know what the Bishop score is, the Bishop score basically looks at cervical ripening or the, the ripeness of the cervix. So it looks at how dilated it is, if there's any effacement or shortening of the cervix. The station of the baby, the presenting part, where is it? In reference to the ischial spines, is it at a zero station? Is it at a minus three, minus two, minus one? Is it a plus one, etc.? The consistency of the cervix, meaning is it firm? Does it feel hard? Is it medium or is it soft? And then, of course, the position. These all receive a little number. You add them up, and then that'll tell you what your bishop score is. The higher it is, the better the cervix is or the better the cervical conditions are for um, an induction or delivery okay um mm -mm -mm. anytime any of these medications whether it's a dinoprostol cervidil misoprostol or cytotag you know anything that we're administering oxytocin anytime that it leads to tachycystole or fetal distress we want to remove it Okay, we want to stop it because we want to make sure that the baby is okay. Um, the other method of induction, also used as augmentation, is an amniotomy. An amniotomy is just basically an artificial rupture of membranes, which means the membranes or the sac doesn't rupture, the water doesn't break on its own. The physician comes in here and he takes an amnio hook and the amni hook he puts it in there this is all a sterile procedure and he literally ruptures he pricks the little balloon water balloon and he ruptures it and all the water starts coming out you know the amniotic fluid starts coming out and um, it actually helps to induce or augment labor in order to do that they have to be at least two centimeters dilated so the provider has to go in there do a vaginal examination, make sure they're at least two centimeters um, dilated. The baby must be well applied. Why? If the baby is not in the birth canal and it's not well applied, if your baby's floating, you know, minus three, floating, balladable, not engaged, when you rupture membranes, there is a chance 
of having an umbilical cord prolapse. Okay, an umbilical cord prolapse is an obstetrical emergency, and we don't want that. So that's why this is done not by the nurse. This has to be done by the provider, and they need to make sure that the baby is well applied. They need to be there in case we have an emergency. But yes, amniotomy, artificial rupture of membranes, ARAM, also helps for uh, induction or augmentation. Um, speaking of augmentation, what is augmentation? Augmentation, it basically means a woman comes in, she already started labor on her own, and we are now kind of helping her along to somehow speed up the process a little bit, all right? We augment labor via the same methods. We wouldn't use Cervidil because at that point you're expected, you know, if you're, if you're augmenting, they're more than three centimeters. Um, we would use oxytocin to augment. We can also augment via amniotomy, you know, the rupture, artificial rupture of membranes. And um, um, it helps them to progress quicker, all right? But lower doses of oxytocin are required for augmentation since labor is already, you know, in progress. Since a woman has already initiated the process on her own. We'll talk a little bit about external cephalic version. This is rarely done nowadays um, because there's a lot of risk factors. There are babies, for example, if you have a breech baby, they do it. Some physicians still do it. They will give mom um, a uterotonic, which means like terbutaline breathing to relax the uterus a little bit. And then with an ultrasound, they are being guided and manually, externally, they actually rotate the baby that's inside the, um, the uterus, okay? Um, there are risk factors associated with this. Why do people do this? Because they want to avoid having a C-section. If the baby is breached, chances are they have to go to a C-section. However, if a physician can come and do external cephalic version, they can rotate the baby, make them cephalic, and now they can have a vaginal delivery. However, a woman can have... Um, placental detachment, they can have an abruption, different things can happen. It is contraindicated if a woman has placental abnormalities, okay? If they have a previa, obviously you're not going to do this because they will not be able to deliver vaginally anyway. Risk associated are like severe variable decelerations, umbilical cord compression, and um, so it can get a little bit messy. I have never seen it done. None of the physicians that I've ever practiced with do it because they feel the risk are too much, that it's not worth the risk. Um, they, doctors usually do, it's kind of like palpating and feeling where the baby's at with the Leopold's maneuver. And let's talk about operative vaginal delivery. What is an operative vaginal delivery? It is a vaginal delivery that requires the use of a vacuum extraction or forceps, okay? This is when the um the baby the mom is tired it could be mom is tired and she's pushing but not pushing hard enough or maybe the baby's a little big you know and so the doctor wants to help mom along and they do it either with a vacuum um which we also know as a kiwi or forceps forceps are not used that often anymore they usually use a vacuum um and they tell mom, okay, mom, push. And every time mom pushes with a contraction, we never push without a contraction. When mom pushes with a contraction, the doctor pulls with the vacuum. So it's both. He's helping mom out. And um, the idea is to get the baby out. Now, um, basically to improve maternal and fetal status by shortening the second stage of labor. Remember the second stage of labor occurs from when they go to complete to the delivery of the baby. Please note with a vacuum assisted delivery, okay? The doctor, number one, you need to be documenting everything, okay? Um, the doctor only has three attempts and they must attempt these three times in a window of 15 to 20 minutes, okay? And pop-offs, which means they can only have two pop-offs, okay? So if they went and he applied it and it came off, pop-off, all right, he can try a second time. And let's say when he's pulling and mom is pushing, 
pops off again baby's still in there at that moment you being the good nurse that you are you say doctor so-and-so or provider so-and-so because it could be a you know a midwife um this is your third attempt okay you're letting him know or her know that you're watching and that you know they only have three attempts without making a scene without making the patient or relatives worried about what's going on you don't allow your provider to go for the fourth time it is not okay it can cause damage to the baby so we don't do that so they have three strikes they're out if it pops up the third time that they applied it they're done they're not going back in there with another kiwi and chances are that if this baby's not coming out quickly they're going back for a cesarean section okay so cup detachment when it pops off it um, it could be a warning sign that it's too much pressure or ineffective force is being exerted on the fetal head okay and if it pops off the third time they're usually preparing to go for a cesarean section okay um, please note that as a result of using whether it's a vacuum or forceps there are greater chances of having vaginal or cervical lacerations so if you are the postpartum nurse and you're caring for a patient who is who just delivered a baby and when they give you a report, they tell you, oh, it was a vacuum assisted delivery or it was a forceps assisted delivery. You, being the intelligent nurse that you are, are going to say, hmm, I need to look out for this patient and make sure that when I'm assessing their lochia, that I assess for possible bright red bleeding. Because it could be that she lacerated with the use of the forceps or the kiwi. And sometimes doctors miss it. Okay. Sometimes they repair the lacerations and they might miss a tiny little spot. And through that tiny little spot, a woman can bleed out. They can hemorrhage. So you need to keep your eyes peeled. Whenever they tell you you have a patient who delivered and they, they had to use a kiwi or forceps, you want to make sure that you monitor their lochia and see if, they have any, if they're trickling any bright red blood. Okay, so it increases the chances of vaginal cervical lacerations and extension. If the doctor had already done an episiotomy, it can also extend it, which means it goes from episiotomy to laceration. Um, it can also lead to uterine atony or rupture, bladder trauma, okay, because you're sticking these metal things in there or this vacuum. The vacuum is a little less chances of having bladder trauma, but it can still happen. And then, of course, anytime you're sticking anything in there, you're increasing the chances of infection. For the baby, it can cause cephalohematoma. Remember, with those clearly defined borders that don't cross the um, the suture lines, okay? Intracranial hemorrhage, which is why we do not allow them to apply it a fourth time. And then, of course, scalp lacerations and bruising that can occur either from the vacuum or the forceps, which is why when we have an HIV patient, we want to make sure that there is no need for the use of a vacuum or forceps because if the baby develops a scalp laceration you increase their chances of contamination okay the same thing occurs with both of them okay with the forceps though in addition to the laceration they can actually have skull fractures nerve injuries inclu including craniofacial and brachial plexus remember the assessment of the um startle reflex if this baby, if they use the forceps when they were delivering this baby and they have nerve damage, maybe that baby won't be able to bring that arm up in, in response to the reflex, to so the startle reflex, okay? Um, operative birth, which is a cesarean section, and we'll talk about it more a little later. Then we have what we call um, a VBAC, vaginal birth after a cesarean section. What is a VBAC? A VBAC is precisely that. Delivering a baby vaginally, even though you have a previous cesarean section. Um, this can be done. It is quite safe. Um, however, they do run the risk of having a uterine rupture. Okay. Now, you can only attempt. You can only have a TOLAC. What is a TOLAC? It's a trial of labor after a cesarean section. If you have a successful TOLAC, you end up with a VBAC, vaginal birth after a cesarean section. So you follow my, my, you know, the process. You start with a TOLAC, and then if you're successful, you have a VBAC, okay? Now, they do have run the chance of having a uterine rupture. What are some of the signs and symptoms? If the uterus ruptures, the woman is going to complain of sharp pain, burning pain, in the area where they probably had their previous cesarean section 
okay? And if that happens, whenever we're doing toe lag, the doctor has to be, you know, near within a 20 minute um, drive to be able to take care of the patient and perform a cesarean section because it is an obstetrical emergency if you have a uterine rupture. Success rates of VBACs are 60 to 80%, okay? And um, the factors that increase the chances of having a successful VBAC is if they have a previous VBAC, obviously, if they have spontaneous onset of labor, labor is the meaning that the labor was not induced. And in fact, we don't like to induce this because you do not want to administer oxytocin to a uterus that is not intact because they have a previous cesarean section. Now you can attempt a VBAC, a TOLAC, if you've had one or two cesarean sections, if you've had three cesarean sections, you are no longer a candidate, okay? So contraindications for VBAC. Also, if you have a prior vertical or a classical incision, like back in the days, they didn't cut you low transverse so that you could still wear your bikini. No, they would cut from the top down, all right? If you have that type of classical T-shaped incision, you are not a candidate. If you have a history, if you had a previous uterine rupture, you are no longer a candidate. If you have pelvic abnormalities, meaning you can't deliver this baby vaginally because your pelvis is too small, why are you going to put yourself through this, you know, process and risk if you know you're probably not going to have a successful vaginal delivery? So if a person had a C-section and you ask them, why did you have a C-section? And they say, well... Um, what happened was that my pelvis was really small, so I couldn't deliver the baby. The doctor said it was CPD. Uh, ding, 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 red flag. If her pelvis was small the last time, guess what? It's still small. So she's probably not going to have a successful VBAC. So why are you going to put her through that? Now, if your patient tells you, oh no, what happened is that my blood pressure went up. The baby was, you know, I was dilating great. Everything was going great. My blood pressure went really high and the doctor didn't want to wait anymore, so they did a cesarean section. Okay, so you know that the issue was not her pelvis, all right? So you can attempt, you know, have an attempt at a, a toe lag. And um, obviously, if you are in a birthing center where they cannot do an immediate or an emergency cesarean section, you have no business attempting a VBAC in a birthing center. Why? Because by the time they bring you from the birthing center to the hospital, unless it's within the hospital... Um, you can bleed out, your baby can die, a lot of things can happen, so we do not look for trouble, okay? Um, let's talk about obstetric complications. What are some complications in obstetrics? One of them is post-term pregnancy and birth. These are mommies that carry their babies past 41 weeks, okay? So... Past 41 weeks, and um, which is, you know, highly unlikely. Now, I, I don't, I don't think I've ever seen that, um, but it can happen. However, we want you guys to know that there are several risk factors for post-term pregnancy, including nulipary. This happens to women who are having their first baby. Um, if they have a history of post-term pregnancy. Um, if they're carrying males, boys tend to go longer in utero, and then also women who are obese, okay? When we have, when we go past 41 weeks gestation, there are risk factors too, okay? There are um, things that can happen. I mean, people tell you, wait until you're 40 weeks to have your baby, and that's great. Yes, that's the, that is the target, you know, um, time, 40 weeks. Because once you go past the 41 weeks, a lot of things can happen. There's actually a risk of having still birth. It increases beyond 41 weeks, which means your baby will not be born alive. Okay. Um, the baby could become macrosomic because it's in there. It's growing faster and then she won't be able to deliver them vaginally. You have dysfunctional labor. They, if you know, if you have this big baby, of course, mom is probably going to experience lacerations. Um, postpartum hemorrhage because the gravid uterus the more it expands the higher your chances are of hemorrhaging okay so it's not something that we particularly love you know some women say I don't want to be induced I don't want to be induced I don't want to be induced and they get to 41 weeks and their body is like nope we're not ready we're not ready you know so they're taking these chances. A lot of doctors will tell their patients, listen, about 41 weeks you haven't delivered, I'm inducing you, okay? 
Um, again, risk to the fetus or still birth or neonatal death, macrosomia, because they're post-term fetuses. And um, there's also this syndrome that's called post-maturity syndrome, okay, or fetal dismaturity. And um, it happens to about 10 to 20% of the post-term pregnancies. And what happens is the baby becomes actually really skinny and long because the placenta may be calcified and it's no longer able to supply the fetus with what it needs. And so the baby becomes long and skinny. They have decreased subcutaneous fat, okay? There's no longer any vernix or lanugo. They can have uh, meconium staining of the amniotic fluid because they pass meconium in utero. Um, so there's complications with that as well. Uh, there's decreased placenta reserve because the placenta is old, all right? You'll find that they have, they can have little infarctions in the placenta, depositions of calcium or calcified placenta and fibrin within the tissue. And if you have calcifications and fibrin, guess what? You're not perfusing. You're not perfusing the baby properly, all right? And then, um, again, macrosomia, I talked about that already. So make sure that you understand that. Then we have in 10 to 20% of the deliveries, we can have meconium stained fluid. Again, these babies are bigger already. So they start having bowel movements in utero and then they run the risk of aspirating during labor or during the delivery, okay? Which can result in respiratory distress. And we know, okay, so meconium looks like tar, roof tar. It's very sticky, okay? And then can you imagine that in your lungs? How are you going to take it out, all right? It is very difficult, so it can cause respiratory distress, and it can actually be um, life-threatening. It obstructs the airway. It causes dysfunction of surfactant, and um, it can cause chemical pneumonitis and pulmonary hypertension. Infants with meconium stained amniotic fluid. So let's say your patient comes in, membranes are ruptured, and when the when the amniotic fluid comes out from mom, it doesn't look you know clear whitish. It looks greenish or yellowish. Um, that's meconium stained amniotic fluid. You do not want to dry stimulate these babies. You want to dry them, but you don't want to stimulate them, okay? Um, because you want to make sure that you suction first. Keep that in mind. Um, still birth or intrauterine fetal demise. It's basically the fetal death after 20 weeks gestation. All right. Before that, it's a miscarriage. It's an abortion. Still birth or fetal demise is after 20 weeks gestation. Risk factors. Sometimes it's unknown. Nearly half of the cases of still birth or intrauterine fetal demise have unknown ideologies, which means we don't know what happened to them. It can happen, it happens more often in women who are younger than 15 years of age or older than 45, okay? Um, there's also, it's also been linked to low income and, um, you know, patients who have decreased access to health care. With fetal demise, prolonged retention of the dead fetus may lead to the development of DIC, disseminated intravascular coagulation, which is why once we determine that the baby is diseased, that we have a fetal demise, mom has to be induced. That is one of the reasons why we do an induction as well. The baby has to come out. And yes, they deliver vaginally, ideally. People might think that's traumatic, you know, et cetera. I used to be one of those people. And then you realize, wait a minute, you know what's more traumatic? To have to go through a C-section and then have a scar the rest of your life that reminds you of your fetal demise. So they do have to deliver these babies. They don't have to, but they definitely attempt to have them deliver vaginally. Okay, Induction of labor should occur within 24 to 48 hours of confirmed diagnosis, meaning once they identify that the baby has uh, passed, they uh, need to induce them. Chorioamnionitis. What is chorioamnionitis? It's basically, it's a group of conditions um, that include inflammation and infection, very degrees of inflammation and infection. And um, it can, you know, lead to complications in the mom. It can cause infection afterwards of the endometrial, endom endometriitis. Um, and it's painful for the for mom, I'm sorry. 
Um, this can usually happen when mom has been, when, when they have prolonged rupture of membranes, they've been ruptured for a long time. I've had clients who come in and they're like, well, I started leaking three days ago. So for three days, bacteria, remember what keeps the baby in a sterile environment are the membranes. And once those are ruptured, bacteria can go in there like, you know, easily. So, um, if the woman, let's say they have GBS, that's a problem and they go up about their business without realizing or ignoring the fact that they're leaking amniotic fluid, um, it can, you know, get complicated really. Um, then we're going to talk about obstetrical emergencies. There's a lot of them, basically situations that either place the mom or the baby at risk for increased morbidity or mortality. So what are some of those obstetrical emergencies? One of them is shoulder dystocia. Shoulder dystocia is pretty unpredictable, but it's more common in babies that are larger, macrosomic babies, or moms that have a small pelvis, okay? Um, basically, as she is pushing, you will notice one of the first signs is retraction of the fetal head, which means when mom pushes, the head comes out, the minute she stops pushing, it goes right back into where it was, like it never moved, all right? And um, this is what we call, we refer to as turtle sign. Because you know a turtle, you know, they stick their little head outside of their shell and they put it back in. Same concept. Mom pushes, the baby's head comes out, and then she stops and it goes right back in. All right, what are we going to do? First thing you as a nurse have to know is that this is an obstetrical emergency. The baby is stuck, okay? So there are things that we can do. The doctor is the one who caused the emergency. And once that happens, you need to call for help because you cannot handle this obstetrical emergency on your own. What are you going to do? First thing we're going to do, we're going to put mom on McRoberts maneuver. What is the McRoberts maneuver? We are going to put her with her legs all the way back, as far back as we can to open up the pelvis as much as possible. You can't do that on your own because you can only grab one leg. So you need somebody else, hopefully your charge nurse or another nurse on the floor, that'll help you push back that other leg. Okay, so you push one leg, the other nurse pushes the other leg, and you need to be documenting the time from when this happens. Okay, this happened now. The, this was called, you know, shoulder dystocia was called at 5 o'clock. And you start tracking the time. How long was this baby stuck, right? So you're doing the McRoberts, you and the other nurse, and you also do, after you do the McRoberts, you do suprapubic pressure, okay? It's applied over the pubic bone with the palm or the fist, all right? And then we push down. The idea is to kind of help dislodge the shoulder of the baby. And the physician will simultaneously do the Woods corkscrew maneuver. So it's kind of like a screw, and it's trying to unscrew the baby. It's stuck, right? Basically, it rotates the posterior shoulder 180 degrees to disimpact the anterior shoulder. So when I say the posterior shoulder, what am I talking about? I'm talking about the shoulder that is towards the back of the mom, not the shoulder that it's towards the top or the anterior part of mom, okay? So that's the, sh the shoulder that they try to dislodge, and the doctor is going to perform that. You as the nurse and the other nurse, you're going to be doing McRoberts and suprapubic pressure. So first thing you do is, number one, you call for help because you can't handle it on your own. And then you do McRoberts, and then you do suprapubic pressure, and you are keeping track of time. Okay? I've had shoulder dystocias. My baby was actually born dead. Fortunately, we had a great... Um, nurse practitioner that did, you know, that was managing the NICU and she was able to intubate and bring that little girl is perfectly fine. Thank goodness. Um, she did need to have therapy because there was damage done to her nerve. She had brachial plexus, but, um, damage, but she's fine. She's alive. It is very scary. And four minutes, the longest four minutes of my life seemed like an eternity. Okay. Another emergency that we have is the prolapse of the umbilical cord. This is what we were talking about when we perform an amniotomy. This is why we want to make sure, number one, that it is done by the provider, somebody who could perform a cesarean section if need be. Um, second of all, we want to make sure they're at least two centimeters dilated and preferably that the head is well applied because if it is not, guess what? Once you rupture membranes, that umbilical cord can easily slide out in front of the fetal head and now you have an umbilical cord prolapse. Um, when you have an umbilical cord prolapse, guess what? If you find it, you own it. It is yours. You leave your hands in there. 
with the cord between your fingers and you're doing two things. You are elevating the presenting part, meaning you're pushing it away from the cord so that it doesn't compress the cord. And you can actually feel the pulsation of the baby's heart in your fingers when you're holding the cord. In that case, again, obstetrical emergency, that person cannot deliver vaginally, a cesarean section must be done. Vasa previa or ruptured vasa previa. Vasa previa is basically abnormal fetal blood vessel that instead of attaching to the placenta, it goes in front of the os, okay, in the endocervical os. And um, what happens is, some t obviously this person cannot deliver vaginally because it's blocking the exit. And um, what happens at times is that if it is undiagnosed and it ruptures, you know, the baby will exsanguinate. Um, it is associated with uh, perinatal mortality of 60%. So that is a big deal. Babies will exsanguinate quickly. Um, most of the times they are diagnosed before they come in for uh, delivery. So you already know that they have to have a cesarean section, etc. Another emergency is a ruptured, a ruptured uterus or uterine rupture. Okay, this can happen for multiple reasons. Sometimes it can happen due to trauma. Sometimes it can happen in the process of having a VBAC, vaginal birth after cesarean section. And um, other times, you know, accident, um, different, different reasons. Okay, uh, again, when a person is having uterine rupture, they can, they'll experience severe tearing sensation, burning or stabbing pain and contractions. Okay. What happens is the body is very wise and it says, Oh, I ruptured, you know, I'm bleeding out over here. So let me contract. Guess what happens. Your baby's being compromised. Mom is, you know, bleeding, but the body's trying to save itself. So again, obstetrical emergency, they have to go to the OR. Anaphylactic syndrome or amniotic fluid embolus. Okay, it's also also known as amniotic fluid embolus. Um, it's often a fatal complication and occurs during pregnancy, labor, birth, or up to the first 24 hours post birth. We don't fully understand it. It is rare. Okay, but it is among the leading five causes of pregnancy related deaths in the United States. All right. Um, many times we don't diagnose this or the providers don't diagnose this syndrome until they're doing an autopsy. Most of the times we don't know. It's just basically signs and symptoms that we see. And we, you know, the woman can go into anaphylactic shock, cardiopulmonary collapse, and we don't know what's happening. Um, I had a friend of mine who had a patient, the patient was perfectly fine. She was talking to her. She walked out of the room, went to the nurse's station. The minute she sat on the chair, the husband was coming out, calling her saying, Oh, nurse, nurse, something happened to my wife. She walked into the room. That was, I'm talking about seconds. Okay. Less than a minute. She walked back into the room and she was, you know, out of it completely. And, um, they had to work her. They delivered the baby right there. Not even in the OR. They took the baby out inside the labor room. They were able to bring her back doing CPR. She went to, um, ICU alive. She coded again and then she passed. And, um, the only explanation once they did the autopsy was that anaphylactoid syndrome, but there's, there's really nothing we can do. And what's happening is amniotic fluid after membranes are ruptured. Um, they gets into the maternal bloodstream and causes this to occur. It causes a collapse. Okay. Respiratory distress, heart failure, DIC, multi-system organ failure in essence. So I, again, encourage you to please review all these topics in your book. Make sure that you guys understand all these concepts. Then I want, we're going to talk about how we care for families post cesarean section. Okay. All right. One of the biggest things we have with cesarean section is that we have increased rates. What does that mean? It means that there is a lot of people getting cesarean sections. Why? Well, there's different theories. Okay. Um, Many times it's because it's convenient, all right? They just don't want to deal. A lot of women nowadays don't want to have vaginal deliveries. They want to have a cesarean section. Um, other times it's 
honestly, because it's out of convenience for the physician. Maybe they're going on vacation. Maybe somebody's going on vacation and they want to have their baby. But our goal is to prevent the first cesarean birth. Why? Because once they have a first cesarean, there are very few women who pursue a VBAC. Okay, so once you have the first one, they have the second, they have the third. And remember we discussed before in another section how every time you have a C-section, you increase your chances of having a placenta accreta. So we want to prevent this. If you prevent the first one, you obviously don't need to be scheduling yourself for a cesarean section. But once they have a C-section, they have the choice to have either to attempt a VBAC or to just go have a repeat cesarean section. Okay. Um, mm -mm -mm. so it is important that we work on that and that we, ed we do this through education and it starts, it has to start at the physician's office, not when they're there to see you. By the time they get to the L and D, they already have made up their minds and they know what, um, what they want. And most of them will tell you, I'm not even going to try. I want my cesarean section. I have so many patients that walk in there and they're like, oh, no, I'm not having this baby. I, I need a cesarean section. I already told my doctor. It's like, you know, and they'll make things up. They go in there before time, etc. Anyway, the only indications or the reasons why we would have a cesarean section is malpresentation. All right. When a baby is um, breached, we know that, you know, that we don't want um, that they cannot deliver vaginally. If they have active herpes, if a patient has HIV and has a viral load greater than 1,000 at 36 weeks gestation, if we have a patient with placenta previa or vasa previa, any reason, or they have CPD or the baby weighs 4,500 grams and you have a very tiny mom, um, those would be indications for a cesarean section, okay? Arrest of labor, like we talked about, there are women that progress to six centimeters and then they stop. So if they have a true arrest of labor, then that would indicate a cesarean section. If we have a uh, shoulder dystocia that gets complicated where the doctor is doing every maneuver he knows how to do, you're doing McRoberts, you're doing suprapubic pressure and the baby is stuck, they have to do another maneuver to put the baby back in and rush to have a cesarean section. All right, so... Um, but there's also, of course, maternal request. I will tell you, and this is just as an FYI, a lot of insurances, when it's maternal request, they will not cover it. Okay, so mom and dad have to pay for this out of pocket. Um, the other thing that it's important noting is that mothers or women who are obese during pregnancy have an increased risk for cesarean section. All right. Um, classifications of cesarean sections. What are the classifications? Okay, we have different types. You have a scheduled cesarean section. Which ones are the scheduled cesarean sections? Those women who already have a previous C-section and they are refusing or don't care to try a VBAC. So those would be scheduled. They're, you know, they, they have a previous and they'll allow them to do that. Um, if the woman has or the baby has some type of health condition that requires the woman to have a, um, a cesarean section. I've had patients that have had accidents where their pelvis doesn't allow for them to have a vaginal delivery. So they get scheduled, you know, you're 39 weeks, we're going to schedule you at 39 weeks gestation and they just come in and it's non, you know, it's, it's quite simple. Uh, we have emergent cesarean section, which means that there was an immediate need to deliver the fetus. For example, if we have a cord prolapse or a uterine rupture, you know, any type of um, situation like that one, it would require for an emergent cesarean section. An urgent cesarean uh, birth um, could be resulting from um, a, somebody who has you know, who's diagnosed with labor and they have a placenta previa or they're hemorrhaging, etc. That would be urgent. It means it needs to happen, but it doesn't have to be done immediately. Then we have non-urgent, all right? And this is basically, let's say a woman failed to progress, arrest of labor, all right? She went to six centimeters and she's been at six centimeters for six hours. The baby's fine. Mom is fine. It's non-urgent. We know that she has to have a cesarean section because she's no longer dilating. However, there is no rush to do it. It has to be done, you know, 
relatively quick because she's already six center six centimeters dilated and ruptured so we don't want to leave her for you know over 18 hours ruptured however it doesn't have to happen you know immediately um risk related to cesarean section like every major surgery because it is a major surgery is infection hemorrhaging thromboembolytic disease and death same thing as with every other um, surgery okay um, again, increased chances of developing an accreta, an increta, or a percreta, which are not fun at all. When we are preparing a woman for cesarean section, please note the woman needs to have informed consent. She needs to know why she's getting a cesarean section. If it's an emergency, she has to be notified. If it's scheduled, she has to know. So the patient has the right to know why she's having a cesarean section. If you go into a room of a patient that's scheduled for a C-section and you tell her, oh, you know, so what's going on? Do you know why you're having this? And she has no idea why she's having a cesarean section. You need to call the physician and they need to come back or the provider. I'm sorry. They need to come back and they need to explain to the patient why they're having a cesarean section and not a vaginal delivery. You are just the witness and you get, you make sure that you sign and that they sign that the consent is informed, that the patient knows why this is happening. Um, we want to make sure that we administer a preload before anesthesia for the surgery is given. We want to make sure that we hydrate them. Why? Because every time we administer anesthesia, they can develop hypotension, and we want to prevent that. Remember, they're going to go on a table. It's a bed. We call it a table in the OR, and um, she's going to be on her back, laying flat on her back. We usually try to displace the gravid uterus by putting a little pillow on the side, on the hip, um, so that it doesn't compress the uh, inferior vena cava and affect the baby. So if you compress the inferior vena cava because of maternal position, and in addition to that, you have a patient who is hypotensive, you know, it's going to affect the baby. So it's important that we do a preload of 500 to 1,000 mLs before the administration of an epidural anesthesia um, or whatever type of anesthesia they're utilizing in the OR. Uh, it's also important that we know we must administer antibiotics prophylactically, okay? Please note, antibiotics are administered within 60 minutes prior to incision. So if on your documentation, the doctor performed the incision at 10 a.m., you can't say, well, you shouldn't administer antibiotics at 8.55 because it goes over that 60-minute period. So you can administer it at 9.30, 9.45, 9.15, 9.10, and that's it. 9 o'clock, that's it. But if it goes over 15, uh, 60 minutes, you know, you're not following the uh, recommendation or the protocols that need to be followed. So you must administer prophylactic antibiotics within 60 minutes of incision, from incision. So 60 minutes before or 45 minutes before, 30 minutes before but not more than 60 minutes before the incision. We also need to make sure that we are applying SCDs, sequential compression devices, prior to the surgery to prevent DVTs in the patient. Um, very important, the time out, okay? You never omit a time out. Even in an emergency, you need to make sure that you have the right patient. And um, there is no excuse. There's other things that you don't necessarily have to do. You don't even have to count the laps or the instruments in an emergency. However, you cannot skip the, um, the timeout in a cesarean section or in any, really, in any surgical intervention. So those are the things with perioperative care. Um, <clears throat> important QBL quantitative blood loss we need to know how much blood is lost during a cesarean section okay there's a process that needs to be followed you have to monitor how much blood is going into the uh, canisters that are in the OR you need to weigh any sheets or any chucks that are soiled with blood um, and based on, you know, mathematical calculations, everything has to be weighed and we need to know how much they're losing. What is normal blood loss in a cesarean section? Up to a thousand mLs, okay? Up to a thousand mLs 
it's expected in a cesarean birth. <clears throat> More than that would be considered hemorrhaging. There are different types of incision. You have transverse, you have low transverse, you have the classical vertical and the vertical abdominal wall skin incision. Okay, so there's different types of incisions. The one that are used the most now is, um, the ones that are used the most now are low transverse uterine incision. Okay, so it looks like a little smiley face, so you could still wear your bikini if you want to. Um, <clears throat> you need to know that. Let's see. Again, guys, I can't stress enough how you cannot omit a timeout in the OR. Post-operative care, post-operative care. Very important that we continue to monitor them for respiratory depression because it could be a sign, I mean, a side effect or a complication of anesthesia. We want to definitely monitor them for DVTs. We want to monitor them for hemorrhaging. We also want to monitor them for paralytic ileus. What is a paralytic ileus? Whenever you receive um, a spinal, spinal anesthesia or an epidural, everything from like, you know, below your chest down is paralyzed, including your intestines. So if a patient decides to have a snack right after she came out of the OR, she can develop paralytic ileus and it can land her in the ICU. So we don't want that. We want to make sure that we auscultate and that we're listening to bowel sounds. We don't allow them to eat. Usually most doctors don't allow their patients to eat until they're passing gas. Um, so we want to be able to, you know, confirm with auscultation that we can hear bowel sounds in our patient post cesarean section, not immediately, but once they start moving their legs a couple hours after that, we should be hearing bowel sounds in our patient. That is one of the complications we want to monitor for. And of course, infection. Um, we also want to check out the incision. We want to make sure we want to check for Rita, redness, edema, ecchymosis, discharge, and approximation, all of those things. If it was a vaginal delivery, of course, we're doing the same thing for an episiotomy or a laceration that's been repaired. In the case of a cesarean section, we definitely want to do that for the incision. And for the first 24 hours, um, you want to make sure that you continue to monitor, you know, respirations and um, hemorrhaging. Um, please note that the maternal respiratory depression is related to intrathecal morphine. Okay, normal respiratory rate would be 12 to 18 breaths per minute. If your patient is breathing at 10, we're concerned. You may want to be calling your... Um, anesthesiologist, all right, to come and take a look at your patient, all right, so post-operative care, that is what you need to be looking at in your patient. I hope you enjoyed it and that you gained enough information to go back, look at your book, read, make sure that you understand all the topics covered.